PlayStation fans could finally be getting the chance to play Sunset Overdrive and Resistance, as Sony registers a trademark for the former Xbox exclusive and the Resistance series. Sunset Overdrive fans had a blast fighting off the OD on the Xbox One back in 2014, and now PlayStation users could have the chance to do the same. After six years of console exclusivity, Sunset Overdrive could be coming to PlayStation systems thanks to a new trademark registered by Sony. Sony has had ownership of Sunset Overdrive for over a year, as it confirmed as much back in 2019. Since then though, the company has said nothing official about the IP or its plans for the franchise. The closest thing to a teaser came back in January of last year, with Insomniac randomly posting a screenshot of one of the OD enemies from the first game. While many caught on to this teaser when it happened, nothing seems to have come from it, though it does seem like that could be changing. Following Insomniac Games' Sunset Overdrive teaser, and the year of silence that came after, there has finally been a major development regarding the series. As shown off by Industry Insider at Nebelion, the Sony patent for Sunset Overdrive has been found online. While it provides little information outside of the name, it does carry plenty of weight, as trademarks usually do not go unused. As such, while Nibel does warn against fans getting overhyped, they do point out just how interesting this discovery is. Currently, Insomniac is busy with Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, as the PS5 exclusive is set to launch in June. Beyond this, it has been widely assumed that its next game will be Marvel Spider-Man 2, with the sequel teased via post credit scenes in the original game and Spider-Man Miles Morales. Still, there is a chance that the studio makes a detour before the webslinger's next game, with a Sunset Overdrive remaster now seeming like a genuine possibility. Beyond this, there seems to be a chance that a proper sequel could be made as well, with a recent leak seemingly indicating as much. In the comments of Nibel's post, Twitter user at Angula shares an image of a leak that was recently shared on Reset Era. The leak shows a list of release dates for announced and unannounced games, and intriguingly, the original Sunset Overdrive is slated for Fall 2021. Going by the fitting name of Sunset Overdrive, Refreshed Edition, the remaster will supposedly launch on PS4 and PS5. However, the more interesting bit of info is the proposed sequel Sunset Apocalypse, which will apparently be a PS5 exclusive. Though no date is attached, this one-two punch is certainly exciting for those wanting to see Insomniac return to the series. With the leaked sequel supposedly being a PS5 exclusive, it could take full advantage of the DualSense controller just like Insomniac's Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, making gunplay and rail riding feel incredible. At the same time the Resistance IP also seems to be coming to be revealed soon. Speaking of new IP, Jade Raymond's New Haven studio garners six more employees and, curiously, every single one of them had previously worked on Google Stadia. After Google decided to quit making its own games for the Google Stadia service, Jade Raymond, who was in charge of creating said exclusive games, left to start up her own studio, Haven. Currently, Haven is already working with Sony on a brand new IP for PlayStation and, earlier today, it's been discovered that the studio has recruited six new staff members for key positions. Good news for Haven, but what's peculiar is that all six of them, much like Raymond, had also left Google. The six new employees apparently joined within the last month or so and all held important roles at Google, roles specifically involved with Stadia. The first is Sebastian Paul, former general manager of Google Stadia Games, who is now one of Haven's co-founders. Second is Corey May, who is Stadia's head of creative services and publishing and is now Haven's world-slash-IP director. Third is Stadia's staff UX researcher Jonathan Dankoff, who is now Haven's insight director. Fourth is Pierre-Marc Barubi, who joined as a software engineer after serving as a graphics programmer at Stadia. And finally, there are Erwin Luruzic and Francis Denencourt, who will serve as concept artists. Six former Stadia employees jumping ship to work at Haven is interesting enough, but this comes only a day after it was discovered that Stadia's vice president had also quit the company for undisclosed reasons. At the time of writing, there's nothing to suggest that he also left to join Haven. The departure of one employee is one thing, but seven within roughly the same time frame is rather disconcerting and makes it easy to assume that things aren't going smoothly over at Stadia. 
It's possible that Google's decision to shut down its development studios played a factor in these employees' decisions to leave for Haven instead. At the time, anonymous sources suggested that poor management at the company resulted in the closures, with many employees being less than thrilled with the sudden news. What was even worse was that employees had been praised a week before the news broke, meaning they were ultimately misled. Stadia has been unfortunately saddled with a rather sour reputation, making it an easy target for mockery and scorn. However, it doesn't sound as if Google is ready to give up on the service yet. It still intends to make more games available on Stadia, as well as incorporate more features. Most recently, it finally added a search bar to Stadia, something many assumed would have been available when it launched. Moving forward we have a series of news from the recent Epic vs Apple lawsuit. Epic Games appears to be reaching out to several console developers to expand the platforms of first-party titles, according to leaked documents. Some newly leaked documents reportedly coming from Epic Games suggest that the developer and owner of one of the largest online PC gaming storefronts is looking to pick up some console exclusives. One exclusive developer of interest to Epic Games includes Sony's PS5 and PS4 exclusives, which have had a history of crossing over to PC after a year or so on consoles in the past. The leak is reportedly from internal documents that suggests Epic Games' interest in making deals for games from Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo, specifically looking at grabbing first-party titles. If true, some of what's found in these internal documents suggests that the company is aware of the low likelihood of some of this outreach, claiming one in particular as a non-starter. According to the documents, Epic Games has prepared an offer of $200 million to Sony for first-party games that are currently exclusives to the hardware developer's consoles. Interestingly, this is the same amount of money as Sony recently invested in Epic Games, which means the two companies would be passing around that huge sum if the deal goes through. However, it doesn't appear that Sony has responded to the offer, as the documents include the note that Epic Games is still waiting for a response. More notes from the documents also indicate that Epic Games is looking to reach out to Microsoft and Nintendo for first-party titles in addition to the large money offered to Sony. On the Microsoft side, it looks like the PC Game Pass team might not be entirely open to opening up exclusivity to the Epic Game Store. Nintendo is the one that Epic Games has labeled a non-starter or moonshot, considering the developer's previous history with first-party exclusives. Expanding the exclusivity of games out from a single console to both console and PC could destroy the uniqueness and pride of the console industry. Additionally, Sony has been open to ports of certain PlayStation exclusives, such as Days Gone, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Death Stranding, which makes Epic Games' outreach understandable. These deals still appear to be in their early stages though, so it could be a while before any games start making their way from PS4 and PS5 over to the Epic Games Store but I personally do not like God of War and several other games going to the PC market. The next news coming from that might not be shocking, as a new statement from Xbox Vice President Lori Wright reveals that the company has sold every Xbox console it has released at a loss. Xbox is one of the biggest companies in the video game industry and has been around for years. However, it looks as though the company never makes a profit off of actually selling Xbox consoles. The news comes as a result of the ongoing Epic Games vs. Apple court case. The Epic Games vs. Apple trial has already been disrupted by fans, and its questioning of industry executives has led to the release of a lot of information that normally wouldn't be seen by the public. The court case has revealed emails between Xbox and Epic Games, for example, as well as some of the planned crossovers and concerts for Fortnite. One recent bit of information comes as a consequence of Xbox Vice President Lori Wright being called to testify in the case. While being questioned by Epic Games lawyer Wes Earnhardt, Wright was asked what margin the company makes on its console sales. Wright said Xbox sells its consoles at a loss, and when asked why, Wright said the manufacturer focuses on delivering a gaming experience to more players, allowing the company to profit off of subscription services like the popular Xbox Game Pass and digital sales. The line of questioning came from Epic in an effort to show that video game consoles have good reason to take a 30% cut of digital game sales, as that is their primary revenue source. It wants to show this to argue that Apple should not do likewise through its App Store, as it makes a profit on the sale of iOS devices too.
However, the news is not all that surprising, as video game hardware is typically sold at a loss to get it into more players' hands. Some companies, such as Nintendo, do their best to make a profit off hardware, but it seems that Xbox is more than fine continuing to sell at a loss. Xbox's stated focus on services like Xbox Game Pass to make a profit does make sense. But it's also confirmed that Xbox Game Pass also does not make any profit. Xbox has invested heavily into bringing more and bigger titles to Xbox Game Pass frequently, and it reportedly wants to bring Xbox Game Pass to other consoles. Whether or not that happens remains to be seen, but it will be interesting to see what other information comes out of the court case. It is expected to run for two weeks, so there is plenty of time left for more interesting news. It seems like Xbox didn't provide any valid documents for their claims and Apple is mad at them. An email emerges between Phil Spencer and the CEO of Epic in which Phil makes it clear that he wants Xbox Game Pass and xCloud on other consoles. The head of Xbox has not given up on bringing xCloud to as many platforms as possible, including consoles. Phil Spencer has high ambitions for the future of cloud gaming, and he sees Xbox as a company that is at the forefront of that charge. But according to a recent email, he doesn't seem to be quite done yet. Xbox's cloud-based service is currently running on PC and Android devices. xCloud also is running on iOS via a web-based preview program thanks to a workaround that the Xbox team spent quite some time developing. In fact, this appears to be exactly how Spencer's comments about getting xCloud on as many platforms as possible came about. Email communications have popped up between Phil Spencer and Epic CEO Tim Sweeney, who is right in the midst of the massive Epic vs. Apple court case. Just as Fortnite was taken off of iOS devices, Spencer's xCloud was unable to get pushed through the standard app store, after once having been approved during an early access beta stage. The web-based approach seems to work for iOS users after hard work, but more interesting is the idea that Spencer wants to bring xCloud to more platforms including consoles. In emailing Sweeney, Phil told the CEO that Xbox wants to expand its cloud streaming to other consoles. He specifically mentions that he hasn't given up on bringing that service to other platforms. Early last month, there was an apparent rumor that Nintendo and Microsoft had struck a massive deal, and many still wonder if this could be that xCloud and Xbox Game Pass will find their way to the Nintendo Switch. The xCloud service ties directly to Xbox Game Pass. Point one thing that is interesting is that currently, xCloud is not even on an Xbox One or Xbox Series X and S consoles. So perhaps before Phil and company think about bringing the service to Nintendo, PlayStation, the Epic Game Store, or anywhere else, it should be available to Xbox console gamers. It looks like Xbox is not trying to compete on games, but with services. Earlier Phil Spencer confirmed that Amazon Luna and Google Stadia are Thier competitors. But now Xbox Vice President Lori Wright confirmed that PlayStation are their competition. It seems like there is a lot of confusion and lies in the Xbox industry and within Phil Spencer. If this continues Xbox can end up being a third party like Sega. Anyway after all they can try their best. Also an interesting news coming from the court argument that Epic Games CEO Tim Sweeney confirms during the Epic Games and Apple legal proceedings that he only has a PS5 at the office and not at home. Since the release of the PS5, many PlayStation fans have struggled to get their hands on the next-gen console. And this apparently includes Epic Games CEO Tim Sweeney, who recently confirmed that he also doesn't have one at home. Sweeney does, however, have a PS5 at his office. Prominent games industry figure Jeff Keithley recently took to his official Twitter account to let his community know that Tim Sweeney doesn't own a PS5 for his personal residence. While Keithley may have expected shock and astonishment, the replies are full of support for the Epic Games CEO. Many gamers may find it strange that they have a PS5 at home and the CEO of Epic Games doesn't, but there are tons of frustrated fans on Twitter trying to attain a next-gen console to no avail who have no trouble letting Keithley and Sweeney know. Epic Games CEO Tim Sweeney isn't alone as a games industry figure who doesn't have a PS5, as Bandai Namco Esports boss Katsuhiro Harada recently confirmed that his only PS5 is at the office as well.
The next-gen PlayStation remains in short supply as more and more games receive performance and visual upgrades for PS5 and Xbox Series X S. Many PlayStation fans may be upset that they still can't locate a PS5 all these months later, but they may not be alone given this update about Sweeney. Some gamers and a significant number of scalpers have gotten their hands on multiple PS5 consoles, so it's likely that these games industry figures join other frustrated gamers who are impacted by the rapid pace at which these consoles sell. This also led to the arise of the new viral news that a new report claims that the PlayStation 5 will undergo a redesign, had changes the internal hardware and not the console's design. While the PlayStation 5 is still far from easy to actually get a hold of, anyone who does own the console will admit that it is a stylish one. According to Taiwanese outlet DG Times, as reported on by VG247, industry sources have stated that Sony is looking to redesign the PlayStation 5. More specifically, the console's internal hardware and not its physical appearance. It's apparently aiming to release it in 2022, and it will come with a new semi-customized 6 nanometers CPU from AMD. Considering one of the contributing factors to the PS5 shortages is because of a similar global shortage of computer chips, the hardware redesign could help address the issue and make it easier for people to buy a PS5. Said chip would be cheaper to manufacture, although it's not exactly clear what other benefits such a chip would provide. Furthermore, there's no guarantee that the information is accurate. Analyst Dr. Sirkin Toto has stated on Twitter that DG Times has a spotty track record so the report should not considered completely factual. It is likely that Sony will make a revised PS5 model that's more powerful in some form in the future. After all, it did that with both the PlayStation 3, the PS3 Slim, and the PlayStation 4, the PS4 Pro. It's more a matter of when and not if it comes to a revision. The lack of chips isn't the only reason why it's so difficult to get a PS5. The coronavirus pandemic obviously affected production of the console and, at launch, many units were hoarded by scalpers, who would then sell the console themselves for a profit. It's a problem that has persisted for months even after Christmas. The redesign has created some panic among the customers on whether it will be able to perform similar to the original design, but I think that the redesign could lead to a more efficient hardware and a more powerful system according to the leaked redesign specifications. The news that Sony was shutting down the PS3, PSP, and PS Vita stores was shocking for fans of the company. When news of Sony's decision to shut down those stores broke, the fan outcry was swift with many players worried that some of their favorite titles would forever be stranded on those platforms or even lost altogether. Thankfully, Sony eventually reversed its decision to close those storefronts down for good, but it seems that some developers are now receiving some unfortunate news. It appears that developers who were working on PS Vita projects before and amid the shutdown news will still not be able to submit their games to release on the PS Vita, despite the storefront remaining operational. The confirmation comes by way of the official Twitter account for Lilimo Games, a developer known for releasing brand new titles on the PS Vita even today. In fact, the studio's latest title, Habroxia 2, released on the PS Vita on February 3rd, despite the production of physical Vita games ending in 2018, with production of the handheld itself ending the following year. Lilimo Games released a tweet earlier today reading, We have heard back from Sony, and there will unfortunately not be an extended window for Vita game submissions. So our next project codenamed Forest Guardian or Berry Bobble will not be launching on the platform. Lilimo Games has made it clear several times in the past that the company would continue to release on Vita for as long as it could. Unfortunately, it seems like Lilimo Games, as well as other studios who were actively developing titles for the PS Vita, won't be able to release their new titles for the system. Interestingly, Lilimo Games also confirmed on April 19, which was the day Jim Ryan reversed the various storefront closures, that the company was waiting to hear back if the cutoff date for submitting games would be changed following the news. This would mean it took almost an entire month for Sony to get back to the studio, while the development of these titles essentially remained in limbo. The reason for the lengthy response time could be due to a myriad of factors. Sony may have been internally debating whether or not to continue to allow platforms to submit games at all, or could have possibly been finalizing its plans for an earlier or later cutoff date for submissions. 
Regardless, this news does confirm that the PS Vita will no longer see new releases after a certain point. Additionally, developers like Lilimo Games and Spooky Squid Games will have no choice but to cancel upcoming Vita games that were in development. No more official PS Vita units are in production, and the last approved Vita game, Scourgebringer, should release sometime on April 22, 2021. With that, one of Sony's most underrated consoles and its last handheld will further fade into the background, or they are preparing for a PS Vita 2 launch. Still, we can continue to download older titles on the PS Vita for a while longer. Moving forward we have some Final Fantasy topics to discuss about, as with the advent of the Final Fantasy VII Remake in Turgrade, the exclusivity for the game on the PlayStation has been pushed further out. Final Fantasy VII Remake has been relatively well received by new and old players alike, with the one caveat being the PlayStation exclusivity. However, with the game making the jump to the PS5, with improved graphics and performance, no more official PS Vita units are in production, and the last approved Vita game is Scourgebringer. With that, one of Sony's most underrated consoles, and its last handheld will further fade into the background, or they are preparing for a PS Vita 2 launch. Still, we can continue to download older titles on the PS Vita for a while longer. Moving forward we have some Final Fantasy topics to discuss about, as with the advent of the Final Fantasy VII Remake in Turgrade, the exclusivity for the game on the PlayStation has been pushed further out. Final Fantasy VII Remake has been relatively well received by new and old players alike. However, with the game making the jump to the PS5, with improved graphics and performance, the console will also retain the exclusivity rights for Final Fantasy VII Remake for at least another six months. This is frustrating for fans of the game not operating in the PlayStation landscape who have been patiently awaiting the FF7 exclusivity to run out. It was announced that the PC version would receive the Intergrade version that is being received on the PS5 however, no date was ever determined. It appears there was a reason behind that delay, as Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade on the PS5 has renewed said exclusivity behind the scenes. The announcement of the exclusivity was put at the end of the final trailer for the PS5 release. After demonstrating some of the latest features coming to the game, such as the Fort Condor minigame and Yuffie's scenario, the release date was displayed along with the exclusivity being marked at the end of the trailer. While the message stated it would be released on the PS5 six months earlier than any other system, it did not provide any extra information as to when and where it would release next. Final Fantasy VII Remake has been hailed among critics and players as an excellent successor to the original PlayStation 1 game. While not following the previous story exactly as original fans might prefer, the game has still endeared itself to most players. Exclusivity has become a sore subject for many gamers. While helpful for developers, it can often mean gamers will miss out on a release or two. While this isn't anything new to PC gamers that have been locked out from certain console releases, Horizon Zero Dawn and other titles have given players hope. With this announcement of a release being pushed back, disappointment continues to linger for any player without a PS5. With an announced release date of June 10th, Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade looks to add many features and additional content that players should be excited to experience. As for now, the game will remain in the PlayStation landscape until at least December when further decisions will be made. Owners of the PS4 version will be able to move directly to the Final Fantasy VII Remake in Turgrade if they own a PS5, at no extra cost. And as a final discussion we have to Witcher 3 news, as a recent statement from CD Projekt Red indicates that the upcoming next-gen release of the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt for various platforms could include fan mods as part of the official package. It's been six years since the iconic RPG released, and like other RPGs before it, dedicated fans have spent loads of time working on mods for the original game and its DLC expansions Hearts of Stone and Blood and Wine. If this statement holds true, it could be an insider of big opportunities for the modding community in the future. In March, CD Projekt Red announced that the next-gen version of The Witcher 3 will be available on PS5, Xbox Series X, and PC later this year. Though players with next-gen consoles can already play the game via backward compatibility, the new releases will add visual and technical improvements to use everything the newest consoles have to offer. 
Fans will get the award-winning RPG and all DLC when it releases, but it's also possible that fans will get to experience the handiwork of hard-working modders as official content. One such modder is Hal Hogan, who has been working on a project called The Witcher 3 HD rework since shortly after the game was released in 2015. His mod work has upgraded various textures throughout The Witcher 3 to 4K levels of sharpness that in some cases even improves overall map draw distance. Hogan revealed recently that CD Projekt Red reached out to him about official cooperation, and while nothing is set in stone right now, he said it's very likely that HDRP will be included in the official Next Generation update. Following this statement, Kotaku reached out to CD Projekt Red to confirm. CDPR responded that along with its own efforts working on the next-gen version of The Witcher 3, the company would also be in talks with creators of various mods for the 2015 release of the game. So far CDPR does not have any official agreements with modders and has not commented on how any potential modders may be recognized for their contributions. However creators likely means more than one, which will probably have fans wondering how many great Witcher 3 mods will make it into the official next-gen release. Although developer Bethesda is known for having a good relationship with modding communities of Fallout 4 and The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, more developers are recognizing the draw of modded versions of their games. It's rare to see these mods ever make it into official releases, but if numerous fan mods make it into next-gen The Witcher 3, it could go a long way to making this practice more common. Many modders work on their creations for years with painstaking attention to detail, and this type of dedication can certainly be an asset to game developers with deadlines and stretched resources. Following this Conrad Tomaskiewicz, game director of The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt and secondary game director on Cyberpunk 2077, has resigned from his position of vice president of game development at CD Projekt after facing accusations of bullying at the company, a report states. Cyberpunk 2077 certainly got off on the wrong foot having launched with a slew of bugs, but fans were also disgruntled with CD Projekt Red after feeling misled with the game's marketing. Some content shown in early Cyberpunk 2077 gameplay demos and trailers seems to have been cut from the game completely, making fans feel lied to. But disappointed consumers weren't the only issue CDPR has faced since the game's launch. Previous Reddit comments and reports revealed alleged workplace toxicity centered around crunch culture, which was also refuted by CDPR. Sometime during these months around Cyberpunk 2077's disastrous release, CDPR had been conducting a lengthy investigation around its vice president of game development, Conrad Tomaskiewicz, a report from Bloomberg's Jason Schreier states. According to Schreier, the investigation focused on mobbing, a Polish term for workplace bullying, supposedly enacted by the VP. As a result, Tomaskiewicz announced his departure from CDPR, but he denies the allegations made against him. Interestingly, the report from Bloomberg details how Tomaskiewicz said the commission leading the investigation had found him not guilty of workplace bullying. However, the email from Tomaskiewicz explains that the decision was made by himself and the company's board, and he apologized to the staff for his behavior I hope to change. When Bloomberg reached out for comment, Tomaskiewicz confirmed that he had resigned. Though Tomaskiewicz was a key player in Cyberpunk 2077's development process, his direction on Witcher 3 is largely credited for its success in the gaming community, even leading it to be played to this day, several years after its original release. Tomaskiewicz worked with CD Projekt for over 17 years. It's possible that the allegations of workplace bullying spell for more turbulence with CD Projekt staff not unlike the domino effect of the many abuse allegations against Ubisoft executives last year. While Schreier's report doesn't go into detail on the mobbing allegations, some users speculate that this could have had something to do with the required crunch implemented by CDPR leading up to Cyberpunk's release date in December. But amid all of the controversy surrounding Cyberpunk 2077, its marketing, and its faulty launch, many CDPR executives received millions of dollars in bonuses for its success while developers received significantly less. Because Tomaskiewicz does not fall on the company's list of board members, it's unclear if or how much he may have been paid out prior to his departure. Bringing fan-made mods to official game releases is likely a step forward to promote and respect creativity.
And that's all for the video guys, like and share the video for a greater audience. Comment your thoughts on the topics and if you want to contribute for the growth of the channel, the link to my PayPal in the video's description and in the channel banner. As my resources are very limited, donations are always appreciated and it can help me to create more contents and share news consistently and could open doors for live streams, game playthroughs, podcasts, merch, etc. Thanks for watching the video, subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon, and until then from SMPV it's goodbye.